If you would, open your Bibles with me to Jeremiah chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I'll tell you the background of this story. In, in the beginning of chapter 6 of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah is prophesying to God's people about the Babylonians coming to conquer them because of their sins. And he starts this chapter out with a warning. He says, flee for safety, people of Benjamin, flee from Jerusalem. And so that is the context in which we find the verse that I want to read. And so if you're at Jeremiah chapter 6, go down with me to verse 16. And I just want to read one verse. I'll read some others later, but I just want to start with one verse this morning. Something that I felt the Lord laid on my heart to share with you. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. The New King James Version says, ask for the old paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Isn't that refreshing? But you said, we will not walk in it. So I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, the old paths. The old paths. How many of you are hungry for the old paths? I miss them sometimes. I have reached an age where I consider myself to be old fashioned. And that's all right. I think we need a few old fashioned folks in the church who can remind us where the old paths are. Would you bow your heads and let me pray over this? Father, I thank you for all of these, your people and our friends who've gathered in this place, your house. I pray that you will attune our hearts to you this morning and let us hear what your spirit and your word says to the church. I pray that you would let your presence be felt by all who hear this message, either in this building or through our media ministries. I pray that you will minister to their needs. Let this word of God speak to their needs their hearts. And I pray that you will put your thoughts in my mind, your words in my mouth, and it's in the name of Jesus we ask it. And everybody said amen. 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 A few years ago, I saw a change in the fashion of the younger generation of our culture. There was something that used to be in style back in my childhood that had gone out of style, but a few years ago it came back in style among the youth of our culture. And it was bell bottoms. <laughs> and in case you haven't been around for either cycle of bell bottoms in our culture, that's where the pants were tight on the top part of the leg, but from the knee down they flared out in a bell shape. So the top part of the pant legs might be, I don't know, 12 inches around, and the ankle at the bottom of the pant legs might be two feet around. And everybody wore them when I was a kid, but thank goodness they went out of style. They were a nightmare for some of us who wanted to be fashionable. They only looked good on skinny people, which was one of my problems with bell bottoms and I can't tell you how many times the bottom of my blue jeans got caught in my bicycle chain and made me crash and let me tell you it was not easy to get all that denim out of that chain either and it sure wasn't easy to get all that grease out of my blue jeans either And forget running fast in them because it was 
I would say it was a little bit like running in knee-deep water. In fact, my mother used to sew, and she made beautiful dresses for herself and for my female cousins. She was a great seamstress. But one year, she finally decided to try her hand at making some pants for my brother Tommy and me. And no disrespect for my mom's sewing abilities here, but they were even worse than bell bottoms. Because it wasn't just the knee down, it was the whole pant leg. <laughs> you remember those? <laughs> Let's just say we had plenty of leg room in those pants. My, my brother called them elephant pants. I mean, I truly was grateful that those pants went out of style before I got to high school. But bell bottoms came back in style a few years ago, and one day I actually saw an older person, someone close to my age, wearing them. And I thought to myself, well, my goodness, didn't you learn anything from your childhood? <laughs> about bell bottoms I mean they really do only look good on skinny people <laughs> and uh, there were just there there are just some changes that I'm thankful for and bell bottoms is one of them I know some of you are thinking well where is he going with this after reading that scripture well here's where I'm going my point is a lot of things have changed in this world and in this country, Amen. and even in the church. Amen. Just since I was a child, a lot of things have changed. Some things maybe needed to change, because some change is for the better, but some changes that have come, while they may look like progress, they may look better, are not really progress at all, and maybe are not for the better either. You know, we, we live in a day where the church seeks to be progressive. I'm not against being a progressive church necessarily. And <clears throat> we use words like contemporary and relevant to describe the progressive church of today that's trying so hard to appeal to the senses of unbelievers that we've lost our sense of godliness. In many ways, our efforts to be contemporary and relevant have led to the secularizing of the church. And one of the ways I've said it is, in our efforts to be relevant to the world, we've lost our relevance to God in many ways. I, I, I mean, you know, a lot of churches don't even look like churches anymore. In many churches, we've become so contemporary that we've wandered away from the old paths. In many churches, we've replaced the preaching of sermons with motivational speeches. We've replaced true worship of God with concerts that uplift talented musicians and singers regardless of their lifestyle. They're professional. They're bought. They're hired to play on Sundays. We've replaced old-fashioned Bible studies with self-help cell groups. And we've replaced the old-fashioned prayer meetings where people were delivered from bondages with rehab meetings. I'll wait till somebody amens me on that right there. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't go to rehab. I'm not being critical of those who've gone to rehab. I'm not being critical of cell groups in and of themselves. Many people have been helped by rehab programs. But I will say, when you've gone to rehab and you still struggle to be free, I will tell you that I've seen the power of God 
so poured out on people around an altar in a prayer meeting in such a way that they were miraculously delivered and set free from the bondages they had or that they were in. In fact, we used to call it deliverance ministry. I don't know if anybody remembers that term. And it took place at an altar where the saints of God would gather around that person and lay hands on them whether they wanted them to or not. <laughs> and I mean pray right through lunchtime until the power of God fell on that person and delivered them from whatever they were struggling with. How many of you remember that? As a kid, I remember it because I was hungry and I wanted to go home. But I remember that and I'm so thankful I have that experience growing up. And I believe that in these last days in which we live, some of the greatest ministry will take place, not just in big churches. And let me just say, I've I came from a big church to this church. I've been in big churches. I've ministered in big churches. I've had fun preaching to thousands of people. But I believe that in the last days in which we live, some of the greatest ministry will take place, not just in big churches with all the bells and whistles to make them contemporary or relevant, but it will occur in some of those small, old-fashioned churches that still look like churches what I call the mom and pop churches. That's those churches where a man of God is called, of, called by God to go there and pastor families for generations. Amen. I'm thankful that I've had the opportunity to pastor families for generations. We've tried so many other approaches, so many other ways or can I say so many other paths and it seems in many ways it's just not working as well as we thought it would. And I believe we are now seeing God call us back to the old paths that maybe we didn't even know we left as we traveled along this journey. So today I want to talk to you about the old paths and I want to I want to talk about closed up ears. I want to talk about standing at the crossroads. And then I'm going to talk to you about obstacles in your path. So let's start with the closed up ears. I want you to back up a few verses with me. After God had warned them about his judgment on their sins that was coming by way of the Babylonians, in the first nine verses of this chapter. It's in verse 10 that God asks them a question that really explains how they ended up on the wrong path. In verse 10, God said, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear. Now pay close attention to this next part. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. So I want you to understand something about this loving God that we find in the Bible. When we go astray as a nation or as an individual, God is great at giving us warnings. As our loving father, God never stands by and watches us venture off on the wrong path without giving us warnings. It might be in the words of some scripture we read. It might be through the voice of a preacher or a prophet. Or it might even be that still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts, telling us that you better not go that way. That, that's, that's not my path. 
That's the wrong way. You better, you better stop. In fact, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 30, verse 21, and he said this, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. One of the things I love about God is that he never leaves us alone to find our own way in this world. I mean, imagine being born into a world as crazy as this one and having to just navigate our own way through all the physical, spiritual, and even moral and ethical upheavals we face as we travel through this life. I can't tell you how many times I've counseled people as a pastor, people who call me and they're facing what really is a spiritual or a moral or ethical decision of, of, of right and wrong. People who say to me, Pastor, I'm, I just don't know what to do. And I can't tell you how many times I've said back to them, yes, you do. God has already told you what you are to do in situations like this. You just don't want to listen. I mean, one of the things I've learned as a pastor, and I don't even think I learned this in seminary, but I, I've certainly learned it, is most people really do know the difference between right and wrong, righteousness and wickedness. In Zechariah 7, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah and it said, this is what the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. In your hearts, do not think evil of each other. I thought I'd read that twice. But they refused to pay attention, he said. They stubbornly turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry and listen to what he said. When I called, they would not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. In chapter six of Acts, and seven, chapter six and seven, we find the story of Stephen, who was a man full of God's grace and power, who did great miracles and miraculous signs among the people. Remember him? Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit and looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And this is when, because of all these signs he was doing, these people became furious. The Bible says they became furious and gnashed their teeth at him. You might find this hard to believe, but I think I may have pastored one or two people like that in 36 years. <laughs> Not here at this church. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. And at this, the Bible says they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Imagine that picture. Y'all, y'all, can I say y'all? Y'all, I'm talking about grownups acting like children. You remember when you were a kid and your brother or sister was saying something you didn't like and you'd put your fingers in your ears and you'd say, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. What grade are you in? Second or third? So if you've ever looked around you and wondered how people of God can exalt wickedness, while being offended at the truth of God's word. It's not because we serve a God who has not spoken and who has not warned us. The answer is found in Jeremiah 6 verse 10 and verse 17 I didn't get to. God asked them to, to whom can I give a warning and who will listen to me? And the problem in this world and the problem in the modern day pro progressive minded contemporary secularized church 
is the same problem seen in the days of Jeremiah. They had closed up their ears so they could not hear. <clears throat> and in fact, it says that the word of God had become offensive to them so that they found no pleasure in it. When, when you become offended at the word of God, you become one who the Bible says has itching ears. Those who will not heed sound doctrine. In verse 17, God said, I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. See, in those days, they would have watchmen up on top of the wall. And whenever they saw an enemy advancing, they would sound the alarm by blowing a trumpet, warning the city of impending doom. And so God says, I even appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. So God warned them. He told them and they were just offended at the word of the Lord. But if, if your offendedness at the word of God does not change, you, you can be offended, but it doesn't change the truth of the word of God. In fact, his word is the answer that we need for the troubles of this world. And stopping up our ears because it offends us will always lead us down the wrong path. Amen. We live in a day and time and culture that when people are offended by the word of God, they, they don't get convicted. They get angry at the messenger of God and they attack those who uphold the word and ways of God. But the prophet declared that God has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The problem is not that we do not know right from wrong or wickedness from righteousness and holiness. God has spoken to this nation. God has spoken to people. But we've closed up our ears and refused to listen because we're offended at the word of God when we should be convicted by it. Amen. Th that's how we got here. Now let me tell you where, we're, where we are. <laughs> we are standing at the crossroads. In Jeremiah 6 verse 16, God tells them to stand at the crossroads and look, if ever there was a verse in the Bible that tells us where we are as a nation and as a church in this nation, it is this verse. I feel that we are standing at the crossroads. I can think of no better word to describe where we're standing and where many people as individuals are standing right now in this world than crossroads. We're at the crossroads of decision, at the crossroads of choices to make, and God told them to stand there and look. Look down the road at where look look down the road at where you came from. Look down the road at where you used to be and look down the road to where you're going if you keep going in that direction. And then look down this other road. Stand there and look down the road in all directions. Is this the path that you want to be on? Is the path you're on really working? Is it working out like you thought it would? Stand there and look. The Hebrew word means to consider or to discern. God is telling them to stand at the crossroads and think about it. Consider it. it see if, if you can discern anything about the path you're on or the path you should be on. Look down the road in all directions. In verses 13 and 14, if you back up to there, God describes for them the path they've been on and the path they're going down unless they change directions at the crossroads. And what he says is an indictment against both the political or government leaders 
and against the spiritual leaders of the day. So, so look at verse 13. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. I'll wait until somebody amens me on that. And then he says, prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. And, and what God says of them in verse 14 is even worse. And it's still an indictment, even against the leaders of our own day. Look at verse 14. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. And to make matters even worse than they already are, in verse 15, God asks, are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No. They have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. Have you ever known somebody that was just too, I don't know if I can say this, too dumb to know they should be embarrassed? Don't look at your neighbor. <laughs> he said, they don't even know how to blush. They're not ashamed of what they're doing. And to make matters even worse, we live in a time when spiritual leaders cry peace, peace, when there is no peace. Our politicians and leaders from the least to the greatest are greedy for gain. And while our nation bleeds out and bleeds to death from the hemorrhage caused by all the evil and all the greed and wickedness, we dress the wounds of those who are wounded as if it's not serious. It's like putting a Band-Aid on an artery bleed. I mean, people are happy if the government gives them a little stimulus money while letting inflation Climb to an all-time high. I don't know if you've noticed, but that stimulus money, we inflation's outgrown that many times over since we got it. They dress the wound of God's people as though it were not serious. If ever there was a time when this nation and when the church in this nation was standing at the crossroads, it's today, and it is God who is challenging us to stand there and look, ponder all of this, think about it all, look at where we used to be, look at how it was back when we traveled the old paths. I mean, you know, back when, when people's lives were rooted and grounded in the church and when people's lives centered around God and back when our culture believed there really is a holy God who has told us how we ought to live. Look back at the old paths, back when we lived in a world where the word of the Lord was not offensive to us, but instead it brought conviction and served as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That's the old path. The word of God is a light unto the the old paths and then look at where we got off of that path and started down the wrong path find out where you got lost God told them to stand at the crossroads and look at where you're going and where it will lead you if you keep going the way you're going and as you stand at the crossroads looking down the road he said you need to ask someone for the old paths. I like that. I see, I think we have a generation of a younger generation of people in this country who don't know where the old paths are because they weren't there when we walked in them. And so you need to find someone who's been around a while. Find that person that's old fashioned. Someone who's been in church serving the Lord for a long time. Find someone who knows a few things about the old hymns we used to sing back before we had all the stage lights and smoke machines and professional musicians. Find someone who knows about the good old-fashioned preaching of the unadulterated Word of God. 
And find someone who still knows how to tarry in prayer until deliverance comes. Find someone who remembers how church used to be. They know. Find someone who used to walk the old paths before this world went so crazy. And when you find them, you need to ask them, where are the old paths? And you know why you need to ask them that? Because God said, look at that verse again. He said the old paths are the good way. So ask where the good way is. And once you've found the good way, he said, you need to walk in it. The end of verse 16 says that when God told them to walk in the old paths, some of the people responded by saying, we will not walk in it. But walking in the wrong paths always has consequences. Walking in the wrong paths always has consequences. What do you mean, Pastor? Stay with me, and I'll show you. In verse 19, God tells the whole earth, look at it. He tells the whole earth that he is bringing disaster on this people, and he makes it clear that the disaster that is coming is nothing more than, this is what the Bible says, the fruit of their own schemes because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. Oh, see, we bear fruit. We have our own schemes. We go down the wrong path and we bear the fruit of that. And in verse 20, God tells them that their incense and burnt offerings don't impress him at all. Look at it. In fact, he said, your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. See, we have a lot of people that burn incense and bring sacrifice. I mean, maybe not in a literal sense, but we have a lot of people who go through the religious motions of being a Christian. So what does God do when we close up our ears and wander away from the old paths because we find his word offensive. How does God deal with such people? And in verse 21 is where I'm going. He answers that question there. Look at verse 21. Therefore, because you've done this, therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will put obstacles before this people. Fathers and sons alike will stumble over them. I want to be very clear about this. Whenever a nation or individuals wander down the wrong path, God is the master at putting obstacles in front of us to make it as difficult as possible to continue down the wrong path. If you don't believe me, just ask Jonah. Because he started down the wrong path one day, and the Bible says God prepared a great big fish and provided that fish to swallow Jonah. Talk about an obstacle. When we get off on the wrong path, God is great at putting obstacles before us. And let me just say, we will stumble all over them with every step we take. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, Peter was writing about Christ who is our living stone. <clears throat> and in this verse, he quotes from Isaiah 8, 14, as he said that Jesus Christ is, quote, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them Fall, And then he said this, they stumble because they disobey the message. When a nation or when an individual, stray, when, when you stray from the, from the good way, God will put obstacles in front of you all along the path you travel. And God will allow you to stumble your way all the way to hell. 
If you refuse to ask where the old paths are, I'm sure most of us have friends or loved ones traveling down the wrong path today. And in many ways, I pray for our nation because it's in many ways traveling down the wrong path. People have stopped up their ears because the word of God has become offensive to them. We certainly live in a time when so many in this world have closed their ears. But I want to tell you a good way to pray for those people. If you're praying for this nation, if you're praying for a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, if you're praying for a loved one that is not where they need to be with the Lord, they're walking down the wrong path. A good way for you to pray for them is like this. God, I pray that you put obstacles in their path. Now think about it. That means I'm praying, God, I pray that everywhere they turn, things won't work out. They're in a wrong relationship. I pray that relationship will fall apart. They're hanging out with the wrong crowd. I pray that the day will come when they are rejected by their own friends. I pray you put obstacles in their path that will make them stumble all over themselves until they come and ask one of us old-fashioned people, tell me about the old paths. Tell me about how you used to sing hymns and pray around the altar for people. and Tell me about the power of God and how it delivers. And Tell me about the Word of God that I've that I've been offended by. Tell me again that it is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of a sovereign God who created all things and revealed himself to his creation through his word. Tell me about the sacredness of scripture again. Find the old people who walked those old paths We must stand at the crossroads and look. We need to ask where the good way is. We need to find the old paths, the good way, and we need to walk in it. And if you do, I want to show you one more thing in verse 16. If you do this, God said, you will find rest for your souls. Whew, if ever there was a nation that needed restful souls, it's ours. See, I take that to, to be the answer for things like the anxiety that this world just produces in people. The stress, the anxiousness, the fear. I don't know about you, but I need rest for my soul. And this is how you do it. You find the old paths because it's the good way and you walk in it. Some of you are old fashioned enough to remember the old ways. Would you, the old paths, would you stand with me, you old pathers? If you can stand, if you're unable to, that's fine. You could stand in your heart. I pray that God brings people into this church who are looking for the old paths and they're looking for some of you to show them where they are. And I plan to be the pastor that will help them get in that path because it's the good way. Let's pray. Hallelujah. God, I thank you that I was raised in an old-fashioned church by old-fashioned parents. And I thank you that you've made me like them. You've made me an old-fashioned dad. I'm an old-fashioned pastor pastoring an old-fashioned church. And what I'm saying is, Lord, I pray that you will always keep us in the old paths. God, I pray that 
we will once again as a nation and as the church in this nation that we will see that the old paths are are relevant to a modern people a modern culture I pray that you'll help us to see that those old paths are truly the good way it's truly where we find rest for our souls I pray God that you will be with us be with these people and help us to continue to walk that way I pray that you'll continue to turn this nation back to you until we are walking again in the old paths of those who've gone before us. Thank you, Lord. I praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.